To begin this session, the Dean of the Irving K. Barber Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, Sylvia Tomaskova, would like to say a few words. Welcome, Sylvia. Thank you, John. And good morning, everyone. Before we begin the next session, I would like to respectfully acknowledge the Silks Okanagan Nation and their peoples in whose traditional ancestral unceded territory UBC Okanagan is situated. I would also like to acknowledge that you're joining us today from many places, near and far, and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. I am very pleased to be with you today at the Rogers W. Gale Symposium. It is on this virtual stage that our panel of distinguished subject matter experts will explore if constraining human choices can promote climate stability. This event promotes a constructive dialogue in a time where the state of the climate is shifting and global action is required. It is our hope that by conducting talks that present various opinions and experiences, we drive change. But first I would like to acknowledge the incredible contributions for our panel, organizers, and supporters. To begin, I would like to recognize and thank our expert panel. Your knowledge and participation are critical to the success of this event. I would also like to thank the organizing committee, Andrea Craig, Thomas Heilke, Jennifer Ingalls, John Janmat, Liana Knizovic, Dariela Talarico, Robin Wanflu, and Helen Yanakopoulos. They have worked tirelessly behind the scenes and have been instrumental in ensuring the symposium is thought provoking and successful. And finally, this symposium is made possible through the generous support of Roger W. Gale with the partnership of UBCO. I thank each of you for your ongoing support of this important community event. And now I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Michael Ignatieff. Dr. Ignatieff is a university professor, writer, and former politician. He served as an MP in the Parliament of Canada, and then as leader of the Liberal Party of Canada and leader of the official opposition. Dr. Ignatieff is a member of the Queen's Privy Council for Canada and holds 13 honorary degrees. He served as a as centennial chair at the Carnegie Council for Ethics in International Affairs in New York, between 2012 and 2015. He was Edward R. Moreau Chair of the Press, Politics and Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School between 2014 and 2016. And until recently, Dr. Ignatieff was Director and President of Central European University in Budapest. He stepped down at the end of July, 2021 to stay as a professor in the history department. And I would like to know that that university is now even more central considering the recent re-election of Viktor Orban and the events in Ukraine. We are pleased to have him on our panel. And with that, I would like to pass the virtual microphone back to Dr. Janmat. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. On behalf of my colleagues on the organizing committee and our departmental Oh boy, always got to get some technical glitches, <clears throat> particularly from the uh, incapability of the speaker myself. So again, on behalf of my colleagues on the organizing committee and our departmental and faculty staff who have helped bring this together, thank you for your kind words. Before we turn it over to Dr. Ignatieff, a bit of housekeeping. You will notice a Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. Please use this feature to post questions you have. You can scroll through the questions that have already been posted and vote for those that you would like to see answered. After Dr. Ignatieff has presented, we will end the session with as many questions from the Q&A as time will allow. We will select those questions based on both the number of votes and the diversity of the topics which are represented. With that out of the way, I now turn it over to you, Dr. Ignatius. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. I'm uh, talking to you from Toronto, 
Um, and uh, I wish I was in Kelowna, beautiful place. Um, I greatly appreciate <clears throat> this invitation. Um, I'm misdescribed as an expert on this subject. There are other folks you're gonna hear from who are much more expert than I am. Um, but I have done some politics in my life and I've thought about democracy. So I hope what I have to say is <clears throat> useful though it's bound to be controversial. As I see it, uh, the wicked problem we're talking about is whether the planet can be saved from environmental collapse without recourse to coercive politics and authoritarian rule. I think quite a few environmentalists believe once again that since democracies have not made sufficient progress in meeting their zero carbon goals, authoritarian measures may become necessary. In other words, we've tried incentives and now we need coercion if we're gonna survive. And this environmentalist disillusion with democracy is a very important element in the more general malaise about the viability of our way of life. Our form of government seems besieged and in some places at war with a resurgent authoritarianism in China and Russia and uh, Hungary, as your dean mentioned. And democracy's supposed inability to cope with climate change is often seen as yet another nail in democracy's coffin. Now, I, I, I want to disagree with this, and I want to do what I can to stop us talking ourselves into fatalistic resignation about the capacities of our form of government. Because since the beginning of the 20th century, democratic states have had environmental protection policies, beginning with the creation of our beautiful network of national parks, both here and in, and uh, pretty well everywhere in the world in dem democratic societies, efforts have been made to conserve um, the beauty of our natural environment. And since the beginning of the 21st century, democracies have taken action on climate change. Now the preferred form of action that democracies takes could be called liberal gradualism. Uh, I don't mean liberal with a capital L, by the way. I just mean liberal in terms of relying on democratic consent, respecting property rights and free speech, relying on incentives rather than coercion, and on only on those penalties and sanctions that receive democratic approval. And liberal gradualism on the environment has included gas taxes, carbon taxes, subsidies for renewable energies, incentives for re recycling, tax write-offs for environmental innovation um, and those international, voluntary international agreements to limit carbon emissions and then taxes on emission producing industries. I think it's worth remembering that when this bunch of liberal gradualist measures were initially in introduced, they were very controversial and faced resistance. But over time, contemporary electorates in liberal democracies have come to accept them as part of the necessary po policy portfolio, po portfolio, portfolio of every liberal democratic state. And as these societies have become more prosperous, the electorates have changed. Uh, they've given consent to increasingly stringent standards of environmental protection and energy efficiency, and their own behavior has changed. A sizable green middle class has emerged uh, and their private behavior, recycling, cutting back on meat consumption, vegetarianism, nature conservancy efforts um, have helped at the margin to achieve our climate goals. And thanks to these activist electorates and the pressure they put on political parties, the top 20 environmental performers, according to international metrics, are all democratic states. And carbon emissions in these democratic states are not declining, that's true, but at least they've been more or less flat for a decade. Uh, if you look at international studies, um, uh, they appear to show that uh, at least those that are not corrupt or heavily dependent on fossil fuels for revenue, democratic states are doing a better job of protecting the environment and containing the growth of CO2 emissions than authoritarian states. The EU, for example, EU member states have, for example, reduced their carbon emissions while Chinese emissions uh, continue uh, to skyrocket. Uh, 
And then if you look at another index, an index that measures which countries make best provision for future generations across a score of measures, not just the environment, this index concludes that far from being beset by short-termism, democracies generally show more regard for long-term social and environmental sustainability than authoritarian regimes. So <laughs> as a first approximation, and I know this is controversial, our wicked problem doesn't look like a problem at all. Democracies outperform autocracies in preparing for the future. Democracies empower bottom-up innovation and untried solutions. And democracies can create consent for decisive action when a crisis arises. And democracies have managed to keep admissions at least flat. The other thing to say about democracies is that they're good at creating and diffusing knowledge, and nowhere more so, in fact, in relation to the environment. Between the first Earth Day in 1970 and today, there's been a knowledge revolution about the environment among democratic electorates. I mean, I, I date my own dawning environmental consciousness to that first Earth Day when I was a graduate student. And I knew nothing really about environmental science, but today an average voter knows what the biosphere is, knows what climate change is, knows what harm it's doing, knows what alternative energy sources exist and need to be brought online in the future, knows why recycling is important. And this shared knowledge base, which is just a decisive fact about uh, modern electorates, uh, that sustains a steady, if weak consensus in favor of environmental action. And it also stands in the marketplace, a rising curve of innovation and capital flows based on this knowledge revolution. So if judged by where we were in 1970, the liberal gradualist approach has worked. It's pushed back the neo-Malthusian limits to energy and food supply that had the Club of Rome worried. And it's brought us time to get our environmental house in, under, in order. But judged by where we need to go to prevent irreversible environmental harm, liberal gradualism is still on trial. And the question remains whether we have enough time left. And despite what uh, democratic societies have achieved, the most recent IPCC UN climate change panel insists we're not acting fast enough to prevent global warming. And as for Canada, a recent international comparison of climate change policies puts our country near the bottom of 64 nations in terms of having effective um, capacity to meet our targets. The CCPI, which did this international comparison, blamed the Canadian oil and gas industry for capturing environmental policy. They blamed federal provincial jurisdictional paralysis for preventing decisive action. And they blamed our lamentable performance on political inertia, that is the uh, nasty Canadian habit of virtue signaling as a substitute for uh, resolute action. So we need to shift our understanding then of the wicked problem that I started with. It's no longer the question of whether believing that democr democracies or democracy are the problem. We need to shift it to the more specific question of what, why democracies are not acting faster. Now for the Greta Thunbergs of the world, the problem with democracy is deliberation, especially those dreadful climate change conferences that are all is, in her words so much blah, blah, blah. Less talk, more action, she says, and who can disagree? The problem is that in any democracy with competing values and interests, lengthy, tedious talk is the necessary prelude to any action at all. Environmental activists like Thunberg assume that since our survival as a species is at stake, no other goal should take precedence. Talk is a waste of time since people simply should agree to shelve every other priority. But in practice, they don't. Now, in some future that we can only imagine, it might be true that climate protection becomes the only collective goal that matters, but it's not true now. In the here and now where a democracy has to function every day, we face choices between competing objectives, only one of which is climate change. And so in this way of seeing what democracies do every day, climate change policy cannot override all other priorities, 
because in a democracy, no policy ever has such a priority. And so we talk and we talk and we talk, but there are good reasons why we talk. Even when democracies agree to give climate change a high priority as they should, we have difficult choices to make about what we do with equally important priorities. I mean, to give you a Canadian example, it'll be obvious to everybody and listening, climate change in Canada is a national unity question. And there are climate change actions that we could take now that would threaten the unity, possibly even the survival of our federation. We already have the energy producing West versus the energy consuming East. We have hydro producing Quebec versus the gas and oil producing Saskatchewan, Alberta, and BC. And this stuff could tear us apart and sometimes comes close to doing so. And so that's one thing that any responsible political leader who is a Democrat has to understand and regret. And that necessarily slows down what we do. Um, energy transitions of the kind that we need to be on also pose a classic conflict of rights. The interests of a majority who want climate action and want it now versus a minority whose livelihoods depend on fossil fuel production. But that understates the asymmetry in intensity between these interests. The majority's interest in climate change, change action is mild compared to the visceral interest of the oil and gas workers in preserving their jobs. And since in democracy, we're supposed to care about equality, the fact that energy and gas workers happen to be an outnumbered minority doesn't change the fact that they're also our citizens and their interests can't be trampled upon. And no democratic leader can ignore the claims of fossil fuel producers. Democratic values make it essential to make, map out a strategy that enables them to transition out of the industry and retool in a new one. And so the pace at which climate change policy can proceed depends upon the pace at which a fossil fuel producer can offer sufficient incentives to scale down production, reinvest in renewables and retain, retrain the workforce in sustainable energy production. So that's the producers of energy, but then there's also the consumers and they have interests too, as I learned on the doorstep of the 2008 federal election. My party ran on the green shift, if you remember, and we said tax what you burn, not what you earn. And we put a carbon tax at the center of the liberal platform for the first time in, you know, in any uh, Canadian political party's history. And I'm proud that we did so, but let's be clear, we lost votes and we lost votes and seats not and not just in the West. At the doorstep of my riding in Toronto, voters would tell me, I want to do something about the environment but I won't vote for you until you can find me a way, public transport, for example, to get to work that doesn't end up jacking up my fuel bills. Climate change is in the distance. My cost of living problem is in the here and now. Public transport is years away. And so if you ful fulfill your promises, <laughs> that's fine, but I need to get to work on my SUV right now. So the key democratic problem about climate change, as I learned in 2008, is not lack of awareness of the problem. The electorate in my constituency knew the score. The problem is that the short-term pain, higher prices for fuels, outweighed most voters' willingness to sacrifice for long-term gain. And until the substitution problem is solved, accessible low energy transport, you can't get people out of their cars in Canada. Now these problems are soluble, but they take time and investment. And they also take a lot of democratic persuasion. And the people who wouldn't vote for the green shift 14 years ago can now purchase an affordable electric car. So in a sense, the substitution problem has been solved. But the issue here is, do we have 14 more years to solve one problem after another like this? Environmentalists increasingly say the time for liberal gradualism is over, but it's precisely the reluctance of my green conscious middle-class consumers who already recycle, who will buy an electric car as soon as it's practical to vote for ever tougher environmental policies that begins to explain why environmental thinkers have begun to ask once again, whether democratic politics has become the problem. I mean, let me give you the flavor of some of these rethinking of democracy that you can pick up in, on any quick search of the internet or in any conversation in a bar. In Britain, the astronomer royal, Sir Martin Rees, who's a, a truly great scientist, 
has wondered whether democracy shouldn't be suspended to deal with a climate emergency. In his words, quote, only an enlightened despot could push through the measures needed to navigate the 21st century safely. In 2009, uh, an even more famous scientist, James Lovelock, the, the man responsible for the Gaia hypothesis and a great, a great man issued what he called a final war warning. Quote, even the best democracies agree that when a major war approaches, democracy must be put on hold for the time being. I have a feeling, he goes on, that climate change may be an issue as severe as war, and it may be necessary to put democracy on hold for a while. Last year in a more academic forum, a young Chilean political philosopher, Ross Mitija, published a much discussed paper arguing the case for environmental authoritarianism. Quote, having a government unencumbered by democratic procedures or constitutional limits on power could be advantageous when it comes to implementing urgently needed climate action. Just last week when I was browsing through the great French newspaper Le Monde, I came across this from Dennis Meadows, who must be the grandfather of environmental pe pessimism and a great figure who led the Club of Rome uh, effort. He said this, quote, climate change, exhaustion of fossil fuels and water pollution are gonna lead to disorder, shocks, disasters, catastrophes. If people have to choose between order and liberty, they'll give up the second to have the first. That is, they'll choose order over liberty. I think we're seeing a shift towards authoritarian and dictatorial forms of government. These uh, environmentalists all insist that the climate emergency creates a situation analogous to wartime or a terrorist attack or a natural disaster requiring the use of emergency powers and the suspension of democratic accountability and the rule of law. Sorry for that interruption there. Um, as, as we know, Canada, talking about emergency powers, Canada's had its own experience with using emergency powers in peacetime. And that experience brings into focus the question of what counts as a genuine emergency. I'm not sure anyone in Canada is certain that emergency powers were necessary to dislodge the truckers upon Parliament Hill. The truckers, let us remember, were vaccinated workers, most of them, protesting against compulsory vaccine mandates for cross-border travel. Most of them had voluntarily submitted to COVID measures when asked to by the government, but revolted when the government made these compulsory for their industry. This tells me that when it comes to climate change and public health alike, a government is more likely to succeed with incentives and rewards rather than compulsion and punishments. A climate emergency also has two features that make it different from civil unrest like the truckers protest or wartime emergencies or terrorism or a natural disaster. Because you see, a climate emergency is an accumulating crisis, advancing, then appearing to recede, then advancing again, raising questions about when exactly an emergency threshold has been crossed. That's, I think we could define an emergency threshold. I can see that point. But the, the, the real problem is that, that a climate emergency is not temporary. It's certain to last longer than a war or a terrorist crisis or a natural disaster. So when James Lovelock says, I quoted it early, it may be necessary to put democracy on hold for a while, it becomes a little difficult to know what a while might mean. And in such an emergency, what measures might be contemplated? We could envisage a ladder of increasingly coercive options, beginning with mandatory lowering of thermostats, bans on air conditioning, followed by punitive gas taxes, bans on the sale or resale of gasoline-powered vehicles, prohibitions on fertilizer use, outlawing commercial fishing to save depleted stocks, food rationing, and finally, the most coercive of all, family limitation to force population down to sustainable levels. Now these measures might or might not stabilize the climate just as pandemic lockdowns helped to stabilize uh, 
um, our health situation. But I don't think there's any doubt that this package of emergency measures would kill off any remaining economic growth. And the consequences of that for the poorest and most vulnerable are pretty easy to imagine. And once growth stops and unrest starts, then authoritarian controls cease to become a choice and they become a necessity. And a temporary emergency could become a way of life. From climate emergency and the temporary suspension of democracy to full-blown authoritarianism is a short step. And this, some environmentalists tell us, is the price of human survival. I want to emphasize some. I don't want to diabolize environmentalists. I have you know, deep support. I'm talking about a small group of people who think they are seeing further than the rest of us. Environmentalists of this sort who endorse the imposition of authoritarian climate emergencies do so on the assumption that survival has become the only thing that counts. But this assumes in turn that democracy is valuable only to the degree that it serves environmental goals. If it's failing to accomplish those goals, then jettisoning it in favor of authoritarian rule is an acceptable loss. But that I think misunderstands why we care about democracy. We value democracy not just for instrumental reasons because it serves certain goals like the environment, but because as a system it expresses values that matter just as much to us as environmental protection the egalitarian idea, just to take one, at the root of democracy, that each of us matters, and that all of democracy's blah, 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 actually honors the voice of us all. So we value democracy for the way it treats people and for how it arrives at decisions. We value it intrinsically, not just instrumentally. Ecological goals are not the only goals a democracy pursues. Our goals conflict and no goal, not even the health of our environment, holds trumps. Let me give you another example of the kinds of choices we have to make. As right now, Western democracies are currently seeking to defend democracy in Ukraine. Phasing out European dependency on Russian fossil fuels is a critical part of that effort. And in the long term, everybody agrees the solution requires a rapid transition to renewal, renewables. That's not the issue. The issue is what do you do in the short term? Europe may have to call upon increased supplies of oil and LNG from non-Russian suppliers, including Canada. Shutting off Russian oil and gas before renewable fuels are available will throw Europe into a prolonged depression and that will potentially favor authoritarian leaders like Viktor Orban, Marine Le Pen, and many others. And that could put democracy in Europe in danger. The only way through, in my opinion, until the green transition is complete, is to import more oil and gas from democratic providers. Now, let me bring this home. There are substantial unrealized deposits of natural gas in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, for example. The Quebec government has so far refused to allow these to be developed. But were the government to change its mind and allow development, some experts have told me that Quebec could supply as much as 20% of Germany's natural gas requirements within five years. So what's Quebec to do? These are political choices and environmentalists for understandable reasons are opposed. They prefer to see the environmental challenge as trumping uh, any other issue, including support for democracy in Ukraine. And they want to think of the environmental challenge as essentially above politics. It's a kind of religious and moral imperative that ought to silence politics and put a stop to all this blah, 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 including my own. But in reality, so long as democracy survives, there's no escape from politics. Everything is politics, including the environment. And radical environmentalists, environmentalists like Greta Thunberg are playing politics with the best of them. Yet their way of doing politics deserves to be seen for what it is. Relentless denigration of democratic deliberation, it's all blah, 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 together with the ceaseless, ceaseless proclamation that there cannot be any possible doubt of the imminence of ecological doom, looks to me like a form of moral bullying. And moral bullying arouses 
more resentment than support. In assessing the politics of radical environmentalism, it's hard to avoid the conclusion of a British environmentalist, Peter Critchley, who says, we're witnessing an attempt to bully a politics and coerce a public through a narrative of crisis, catastrophe, and necessity. Those who deny that a climate emergency is the priority that must push all other democratic priorities aside are accused of complacency on the one hand or of shilling for the fossil fuel industry on the other. I assure you, I am not shilling for the fossil fuel industry. I receive no support or subventions from any source. Um, the attacks that imply that anyone who denies the priority of a climate emergency, um, those attacks imply that everybody who um, raises the, these kind of questions is arguing in bad faith. But I think in conclusion, that this helps us to redefine the wicked problem. I think the wicked problem is this, the utter impasse that has arisen between those who continue to believe in democratic deliberation with all its infuriating slowness and in liberal gradualism with all its cautious incrementalism, that's one side, and those who believe that the end is nigh and those who fail to see it are willfully blind. So the wicked problem we have to solve, and I wanna be part of the solution, is how to bridge this gap to get one side to admit that liberal gradualism is gonna to have to accelerate and get the other side to concede that if we do commit to accelerated gradualism, we still have time. Thanks a lot for listening. Thank you, Dr. Ignacio. We will now address some questions that have been posted in the webinar Q&A. I remind you that to access these questions, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. You can add your own questions and or vote for those that you would like to see addressed. We will answer as many questions as time allows. We will select the questions based on both the votes they receive and the diversity of the topics covered. And now for our first question which gives more opportunity to talk about what you ended on. How can we improve our democracy to make it more functional and less divisive and partisan? Proportional <laughs> representation systems like in New Zealand can be more collaborative and reach better solutions sooner. What is your perspective on methods to improve democracies? Well, um, it's a great, question, which is what you say when you're playing for time. Um, <laughs> I, I would just, I think all I can offer concretely is that I'm a, a strong believer in uh, citizens panels. I know that um, BC has had experience with this in changing your electoral laws, but I'm aware that in, I think in France, um, the government impaneled a, a bunch of citizens um, I think chosen by lot, uh, and then put them in front of a battery of environmental and policy experts for a long period of time. And the citizens came up with some very important uh, suggestions for climate policy in, in uh, France. And I think that kind of thing is a very promising way to, to improve deliberation. Someone like me, who's, you know, my problem with Greta and I, I you know, every environmental movement has to have radicals. It has to have Greta Thunbergs. It has to have people who believe in her follower. I'm not, you know, all I'm saying is the constant attack on deliberation is essentially attack on democratic slowness. So I'm in favor of anything that creates or impanels citizens so that uh, they can take an active part in, in um, policy deliberation. Um, and and I also think that, um, you know, don't get me started on what we do need to do to make um, democracy more effective in Canada. I, I have been a member of parliament, always in opposition in the parliament of Canada. And um, our, our parliament is an empty shell. 
there is far too much power in the executive, not enough power in parliament. That means that people, some of the people listening to this call are not well represented by their members of parliament. I can't speak about provincial uh, parliaments or city government, but I certainly feel that there's a hollow at the heart of our democracy in Canada that urgently needs to be fixed, but let's be honest about why it isn't fixed. It isn't fixed because prime ministers, and I wanted to be a prime minister like all the rest of them, want to have control over parliament. They want to have control over their MPs. And that acts against the representative function, which is to have MPs listen to their constituents and take those uh, views up to Ottawa. They still do that, but parliament is not fulfilling its representative function. And that that does, in my view, require a systemic change. And it may mean that we have to do something else in addition, which is move beyond first past the post to a, a country where we're constantly doing formal coalition politics as European societies do, because that has a salient consequence, uh, which is that um, green and environmental uh, voters uh, have more salience in the makeup of these coalitions. You look at in Germany that the Greens are in uh, in the German government. Uh, I think the Greens are are um, in other uh, governments in Europe, and that's because they've got beyond first past the post. So I'm giving you a a big ticket answer to the question, but it is a wonderful question. And while I have defended democracy. I hope passionately in my address, I do not think <laughs> it doesn't need approval. It certainly, it certainly needs improvement. Thank you. So the other day I read an article in the Atlantic Monthly by Jonathan Haidt, who explored or, or expressed, I suppose, uh, great discouragement at how the discourse, in particular in the US, has become very polarized and how we've lost even a common agreement around what the facts are oh. and isolated ourselves into groups that generally agree with what we believe. So reinforce that. How do we overcome this call it social media influence, although it's perhaps broader than that. Um, yeah. in, in this need to have a discourse and deliberation in democracy, it's not like we're actually talking and listening to each other anymore. How do we no. address yeah. that? <laughs> God, I thought I'd come to Kelowna visually and have an early, easy time of it, but it, clearly these are tough, really tough questions. Look, you know, I, I, as everybody says, we're in the middle of the most dramatic revolution in the information technologies since the invention of the printing press. And we know from the printing press that there's a very close correlation between the fury unleashed by the Protestant Reformation in 1519 or 1520 and the availability of cheap um, printing materials that spread tracts about the Protestant religion and the Catholic religion around Europe and helped to generate um, a century of extremely violent um, uh, war and uh, conflict. So we should not be surprised that this radical revolution in our technologies is deeply destabilizing to our politics and is producing the thing that your question implied, which is every one of us has our own facts. Uh, and that is, you know, extremely, uh, extremely concerning. Um, but if we step back, uh, I, I said this in my talk, but it is something I've lived um, you know, I, I was in graduate school when I saw the first Earth Day poster with that unforgettable image of the, the globe taken from space by some astronaut, one of the most beautiful images of all, and one of the images that rallies us all to a sense of global commitment to the environment. But that's 1970. Um, I'm not, I don't want to rewrite the history of environmentalism because it goes back a long time before that, but 
the popular revolution in environmental consciousness that began in 1970 is still running. And I, I just think if you look at the common parlance of, of people, um, you see an awareness of that we live in one biosphere, that there are systemic effects uh, in this biosphere, that it is a scientific object that needs to be studied and understood, that we are getting increasing mastery of the systemic character of its properties and its effects. And I think that is becoming a shared part of a ordinary liberal democratic electorate's you know, understanding of the world. Uh, there is climate change denial. I don't deny that there isn't. And some of it's sh shilled for by the fossil fuel industry, just as the denial of the negative effects of cigarette smoking was shilled by the, by the, um, by the big corporations. Um, but I do think, as I look at it now, maybe I've spent too much time in Europe and in North America, it is... We are in a very different place in terms of shared knowledge than we were in, in 1970. And the, the polarization noise obscures, in fact, the areas where I think a slow sedimentation of common understanding is slowly being, is slowly being created um, in the same way that a slow sedimentation of common understanding is happening, particularly in Canada, but also in New Zealand and in Australia. And, and in Latin America about the reality of our Aboriginal heritage. The, the, there's a slow sedimentation of stuff that's not gonna be taken away. And that creates the possibility for um, a politics. And um, so I don't, you know, the polarization is sometimes frightening. I've been in the middle of it. Um, I hope I've never contributed to it, but, um, there is a there's a lot of it out there, um, but the polarization I think hides the fact that we argue um, at the margins ferociously, and our political identities are repli replicating our gender identities, our our uh, racial identities, our sexual identities. Um, Beneath that, I still feel there's a slow, as I say, sedimentation of common knowledge and common understanding, or at least I hope so. Because if there isn't, then you're quite right. All bets are off. And um, uh, the faith that we have in democracy depends critically on the idea that there is a common uh, sedimentation of accepted fact. Um, democracies argue about everything, including the facts, but then little by little, certain things get settled and they get settled. And that then produces the platform in which we have our next argument. And that's, I think how it's, I do believe that's how it's going. Okay. So apparently Dutz Bank is calling for an eco dictatorship to build back better for Deutsche Bank. Should banks be engaged in such climate activism? Um, I think banks have to be partners uh, and banks have to be held to account by their shareholders on environmental grounds. And banks are a tremendous uh, channeler, obviously, of capital. And we need capital to get uh, renewables to market. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, here's a different tact, sort of. Are global agreements better ways to solve environmental issues than regional, national, or even local levels? Certainly, I've, I'm involved a bit in local politics here and have found that uh, it's very convenient to have somebody else to blame. So mm -hmm. if the province imposes a rule that requires a municipality to do something, it's a little easier for them to do it in the face of an electorate that's not happy with it. Um, would international agreements have the same kind of thing in that they provide something of a shield perhaps for national governments or regional governments? I think that's a very um, wise observation. I hope it's true. Um, I, I find the, the COP 
series of of useful in the sense that they set they set standards um, they set um, common standards and then there's a big argument about whether the standards should apply to developing countries or not and there's a big argument about that um, they're standard setters but I, I I think you you've got to go where the power is and the power is not at the international climate change level they're they're useful as I say in setting standards but the the rubber only hits the road when a national government with taxation power um, or you know um, regulatory power uh, can can act and um, and so you know my sense of this is that uh, um, the provinces the federal government have an important role to play you you can't because the you put the positive side on international agreements but there's also a weird way in which the international uh, arena is a way in which national governments kind of push their responsibilities out the door of their own countries. And there's quite a lot of on the international stage of I will if you will, but I can't until you do, you know, that kind of stuff. So I, I do think even though this is a global problem, even though this is a globalized world, you go where the power is and the power is still in the federal and provincial governments in Canada and then the federal and state governments in the United States. And that's where you have to go. And I, I, I think, you know, Canada is a, is a, is a big emitter and a big, big problem. And we need to clean up our own house and going to international climate conferences and lecturing the Chinese, you know, you can do it. Uh, and hopefully we get some international emission standards that we can all live with but um I, I i'm i've been a believer all my life that despite all this talk about globalization that power and sovereignty and effective capacity for action rests continues to rest with nation states should rest with nation states precisely because democratic nation states at least hold that power accountable to a group of citizens and so that's where we need to, that's where we need to work. Okay. So I have a longish one here that touches on some topics we've already touched on, but perhaps uh, given the currency to the audience, we can continue to explore these. So the question is, I worry that a large part of the issue is that large corporations have been able to manipulate our democracies in favor of putting brakes on environmentalism and environmental problems. So I think of the merchants of doubt approach that has been taken on and funded by fossil fuel industry moneymakers. Mm -hmm. The amount of anti-science rhetoric that was illustrated throughout the pandemic, that vaccines are killing people, that COVID is fake, or more extreme conspiracies around 5G, that actually fueled many of those in the trucker convoy create fuel for authoritarian populism, Trump, Le Pen, and Orban. Yeah. How do we address the far-reaching consequences of misinformation, et cetera, on social media and stop that from actually being what undermines our democracy? And then I feel like this just got brought up. So yes, they acknowledge that we've already been talking about it. Yeah. Um, is it undermining rights if the decisions are based on scientific consensus rather than the will of the Koch brothers, the Koch brothers. Yeah. Well, this has been a, you know, my, my sense of what a liberal democracy does is it uses the power of the state, balances that power with counter power, that is the power of the courts, the power of the media, um, and it, and it uses that power to keep the people free. That's, that's what we're trying to do here. And the power that has to be controlled in a democracy is not just the power of big government, it's obviously the power of large corporations. I'm a, um, and liberal democracy exists to tame the capitalist beast, to keep it in a, not keep it in a cage, but, but keep it on a leash um, 
we have staggering technologies, environmental technologies, thanks to the capacity of um, great inventors, great scientists, great engineers, pairing with banks and investors and regulators who are smart enough to, to regulate, but also get out of the way. And the fact that we have these technologies is hopefully the result of good federal regulation, good state regulation, smart banks and investors, um, innovators who can talk to bankers and bankers who understand innovators and, and get this done and get this in the get this stuff in the window. And if you shut that off, you won't have a solution to the climate problem. Um, so uh, I think that's, you know, that that's just pretty fu fundamental. Um, <clears throat> so that's the first thing. And but it's an ongoing struggle to keep the Koch brothers to keep uh, to keep the banks. I've just said nice things about the banks, but the banks in Canada are a huge, highly centralized power. They need to be regulated. They need to be told they have social purposes they have to accomplish or they don't, you know, they won't keep their license. I mean, the federal government has the authority over the banks and needs to use it. Um, I'm not, I don't want to give anybody a, 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 fr a free pass. Um, I, I just want to try and get us beyond a ideological approach to um, climate change management. I just, we really need all hands on deck. We need, we need the big companies. We need the big um, pools of capital. We need the government. We need citizens. We need the wisdom of Aboriginal peoples who often know how to manage these things at a small scale. And we've lots to learn there. Um, and that's why I'm a favor of democracy because democracy doesn't set out with one guy at the top who says, here's how we're going to do it. You know, everybody gets involved and the, and the, and the trick is to get us all pulling roughly in the same direction. And, and, and that's, I, I think we all think, and I don't want anybody to hear me as saying, you know, we're doing fine. There's no problem. There's a big problem. Uh, it's a, let's say it, it's a wicked problem, but it's not going to be made ber not going to be made any better if we don't think of everybody as a potential player here uh, and and see some way to, to to draw people together in common enterprise capital labor government citizens aboriginal canadians as citizens etc okay now we have a number of so a segment of the population that questions whether or not climate change is happening, whether or not it is serious enough and humans are a contributor. What convinces you that it is an important issue that we need to deal with? Um, I think it's been, I, I don't think there's been any moment where the light went on. I, I think, as I said, it, it it starts being in graduate school when I was in my 20s and seeing that beautiful picture of the globe and thinking, holy smoke, that's what we look like. We're this little beautiful blue ball covered in cloud and vapor in, in the middle of the world. And, and I think a lot of, <clears throat> you know, and then I think we've all had moments, uh, you know, I was lucky enough to be out in BC when I was in my late twenties and saw the staggering beauty of the mountains and the lakes. And all that builds a kind of deep feeling that this is so beautiful and uh, we mustn't screw it up. You know, I mean, the, a lot of that stuff. And then, and then there's some actual science. I mean, you, you, I think this sense of, a, of, of an ecosystem as a system, um, is one of the most important realizations that I think we've all had, um, uh, that the weather is part of a system, that the whole biosphere is interacting with, with each other. I don't know where I picked that up. I just think we've all absorbed it in a way. And then those of us who make this a specialty, and as I said before, I'm no expert, 
um, have have refined our understanding of that. Um, I think some of it's also very spiritual. You just, you know, the human lifespan is, you know, 80 years plus or something, and I'm 75, and, you know, so you think uh, we're, we're not here very long, and there is a sense of stewardship, a sense I've got kids, you, you, you don't want to hand them a world that's worse than the one you inherited. I mean, all these things that are, I think, quite spiritual feelings. Some people who are of religious conviction have, have a feeling about nature that is, is part of it. I think the Aboriginal contribution to Canadian understanding of the environment has been immense. I think all of this comes together. I don't, and, it, and it's not so much science, it's, it's the culture has changed about the environment in my lifetime in a way that I think is, has, has changed our politics. Um, and I hope it will change it still more in the future. Yeah, that's certainly, we're in the midst of a, I would certainly think a very large cultural shift on many dimensions right now. Um, so it's really, it's interesting to be a spectator as well as a participant to see how things are going. Yeah. Tagging a bit more perhaps to your expertise in history, I'm just thinking, are there any examples where a nation or a people have faced a kind of challenge analogous to climate change and dealt with it successfully at, while still protecting fundamental liberties? Boy. Um, well, I, I think the short answer is no, because I think that we've never understood the systemic char character of the, 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 the environmental challenge. It's, it's the water, it's the air, it's the ground, it's the fertilizer, it's, it's our food supply, it's the air we breathe, it's, you know, it's all the species, many of whom are threatened by our presence, it's the trees, it's the whole thing and the sense of this systemic challenge that needs to be met systemically. Uh, sometimes reduces this to a kind of state of passive, you know, we can't do this. Um, but I think it's this systemic understanding that's slowly giving us a real purchase on the things that we could do that would make a huge difference. And I think getting an energy transition so we get out of coal production, we get, we get, uh, we, we get to energy, uh, electric uh, generation, um, uh, that is that is renewable will be absolutely transformational. I don't I don't believe we can't if we if we solve that problem that we can't get um, get a um, get a real grip on 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 this issue um, uh, going forward. Um, but we have to. I think I'm trying to mount a defense of politics. I mean, everybody's terribly disillusioned with politics, but I just think that's all we've got. And politics is just talk. It, politics is just arg arguing. And politics is trade-offs. And politics is compromises. And politics is half a loaf. And for very understandable reasons, environmentalists are impatient with that because they just think this is so bloody awful what's, what's happening that you know, we can't afford all this stuff. And I, I'm saying, I'm sorry, there's just, there's no other way to do this. If, if you want, you know, if you want Xi Jinping to decide everything for you, you're welcome to it, but it will be catastrophic for everything else we value. So don't do that. Uh, submit yourself to some politics, take a half a loaf and come back tomorrow and get the rest of the loaf. You know, that that's kind of how I think about it. Okay, so we have another here, back to sort of the social media end of things. The separation of media into left and right appears to lead to a kind of tribalism and further political division. Science progresses and the world is complex, which we've just been talking about this complexity and the feedbacks. So it can be dangerous to shut down discussion and questions because we may miss important information we need for balanced decisions. How can we ensure that media presents a balanced view of issues 
but still is not censored by government. Um, I think all we can do is be demanding consumers. I mean, I, I, um, I sit there with my cell phone and I, like everybody else, I, um, I have shut off stuff I think is unreliable and invested in, subscribed to stuff I think is reliable. It's my best guess. Um, look, there's a risk to that. It, there's confirmation bias. I, I, I think my reading list is probably more liberal and more center left, center right than, than, than many people. So you have to be aware of that. You, you choose reliability. You choose people who don't excuse my language, bullshit you, and you get rid of them if they do. I, I, I try not to pay very much attention to what comes off Facebook and what comes off Twitter and what comes off. I just, because it's streaming at you all the time, I, I, I tend to go with some pretty standard mainstream information providers because on balance, they have um, the editorial judgment, the resources to get the facts right that that, that I value. I don't think we've lost that. I don't think we're in a kind of wilderness where, you know, every opinion is a fact and nobody knows anything and we're all lost. I don't think that. I think a tiny bit of effort on our part means you can get good, reliable information. I think national broadcasters are very important. I don't want to defend the CBC on, on all occasions, but I, I, I know from the BBC in Britain that having a national broadcaster with a national mandate to provide impartial news is terribly important. Um, <clears throat> I've seen the disastrous effects in Hungary, where I lived for five years, of, um, uh, of what happens to a society's very capacity to think about anything when the media is handed over to the cronies of the regime and uh, simply shuts down and throttles any pluralistic debate of any kind. And, and when you've seen that and seen how bad it is, uh, you really want to value um, anything that keeps open the plural space. But the responsibility here is, as, as the question implied, can't be with the government. It has to be with us as citizens. You read a story that turns out not to be true from a source, you get rid of the source. You find someone who's telling you a, that what's really happening in Kelowna or what's really happening in Vancouver, or what's really happening in Victoria, what's really happening in a part of the world that you care about and you stick with it uh, and you subscribe and you pay for it. Almost the most important thing we can do is to pay for, to the degree that we can afford it, decent media. Uh, the, the day in which we expect the internet to provide all this stuff for free is gone. We have to, you know, I, I spend a bit of money every year just to, keep the information streams I use as clean as possible. And, but it's a constant battle because sometimes they let you down. So you need to choose someone else. So we need to be very, I guess I'm going on too long, but we need to be very active, discriminating, critical consumers of the social media. And we need to test this by going to our friends who know stuff and listening to them respectfully. And if we, you know, I always learn when I go and talk to a climate scientist. I come away a bit scared sometimes, but I always learn. We need to search out ourselves um, information sources that we can trust. And sometimes that's media and sometimes it's just people we happen to know. And if I can just do a straightforward plug, um, this event is being sponsored by a university. The university in the 21st century is the most important institution of them all in keeping the streams of information for our citizens clean and pure. Uh, we, we forget this. Uh, universities are at the center of the information and knowledge system of 21st century societies. And so it is vital inside universities that there be a vigorous and, and you know, plural debate about, um, we, we should not be um, teaching our kids a lot of, you know, progressive liberal claptrap. Uh, we, need, we, need, we owe our kids in the, in the classrooms as balanced and honest presentation of the opinion. Because something very large is at stake. It's not just our classroom. 
these institutions, uh, universities are, you know, we forget that the central function of a university is not simply to teach and research. It's also to validate, this is a key point, validate the knowledge that the entire society uses in order to make decisions, right? You know, the economics profession in, a, in Canada sits there and figures out what the hell is happening to the Canadian economy. If they don't do that job honestly and effectively, the government of Canada, the provinces and the municipalities are flying blind, right? So universities are not ivory towers. They're at the center of the business of validating and assessing the knowledge that all of us use in order to get any grasp of anything. And um, that's why universities are so important. And that's why they have such a responsibility in our society. And that's why the battle to make sure that academic freedom and the highest standards of uh, scientific <clears throat> research and, um, you know, ethics, uh, uh, you know, are, are, are respected in, in our institutions. Certainly, those of us who are university employees and faculty members appreciate that. <laughs> so, well, I'm uh, in there. You know, that's that's yeah. that's my day job, and so I'm. <laughs> you know. For sure. So here's a question that's kind of an echo of Naomi Klein's. This changes everything. So perhaps the issue isn't democracy, but actually an issue of capitalism. Mm -hmm. We seem to be focused on the bottom line, even in this discussion at times. Isn't a better solution where everyone's needs are met so that the rhetoric on social media and the dollar followers can manipulate people into not wanting to fight climate change? For example, if all Canadians had a universal basic income and free education, wouldn't many of this, these divisions, us against them, simply be put to rest? And then perhaps turning away from consumerism is what's best? Well, it's, a, it's an interesting thought that um, we could still the partisanship with the universal basic income and um, universal education. There's a massive question about how you pay for that and who pays for that. Um, it comes from taxation. So then you have to figure out how to do that fairly and equitably. But I, I've always been someone who thinks that uh, you can't have a, a democracy that respects equality unless you have a system of social support that makes sure that no one is falls through the grate. I mean, I think that's just a, there's a big argument about how you do it and all that stuff, but a guaranteed basic income uh, seems to me where our social systems are headed around the world. And we now have, I think, the wealth to, to generate that. Where I don't agree is the idea that the problem is capitalism. I, I, I've always thought that capitalism is extremely good at a, a, a couple of things. It's very, very good at registering and responding to preferences. It's very good at allocating uh, resources to uh, uh, the right place fast. Um, I've spent too much time in the ruins of socialist and planned economies in Central and Eastern Europe to have any faith in a system that isn't based on markets and prices and private property and accumulation of capital. Uh, and also as a Democrat, I'm the, the only thing I also say about capitalism is that um, uh, a basic respect for private property is the basis of a capitalist system is consonant with democracy in the sense that that's what, you know, if you have serious private property regime, it means the government can't walk into your house and say, sorry, we're taking over your house to build a highway. You know, you've got, you've got rights, you've got recourse. And I think that's, Capitalism provides some fundamental guarantees of rights protection that um, that we then need to make sure that big business and big capital also respect. As I said, you know, 20 minutes earlier, I I, I think you uh, you know the only liberal democracy I'm in favor of one is one that keeps capitalism on a leash, but 
if we don't have capitalism, we have coercive, inefficient central control. And uh, it gets worse if those people are high-minded, progressive environmentalists, frankly. That is, I don't trust myself to run a centrally planned system, let alone anybody else. So that's, that's where I come down on, on, on that one. But we need to have these arguments. We need to have these debates. And where, we, where you started, which is to take away the fear and insecurity in, um, in social life by having um, a guaranteed uh, minimum uh, platform for everybody, I actually think is the way to go. And I don't think it will destroy the capitalist system. I think it'll create a certain kind of um, uh, cohesion, which I think is good and might, as you suggest, reduce the amount of polarization. I'll tell you something just on this point. I, I had dinner the other night with a with a prominent Canadian who happens to be in, in politics. And, and she made the very interesting observation just in passing that one of the real differences between Canada and the United States is just how much fear there is in the United States. Fear of not losing your health insurance. Fear of you know, not getting unemployment insurance when you transition jobs. One of the good things about Canada is we've taken some, I don't say enough, but some of the fear out of social life. And that's one of the reasons we're a less polarized society than south of the border. So, you know, where I think we could agree, although I'm a convinced, you know, liberal with a big L and a small L as well, is we really are agreed that we want a society which takes the fear out of life for our fellow citizens. And if we could take the fear out of life, then we can deliberate together and talk together and do stuff together. Okay. <laughs> we have one here. I think that connects back to some of the points you were making about the urgency that some in the environmental movement see. So Backlab, Snow, and other authors have pointed out that to get wind, you need oil. So the renewables paradox shows that more fossil fuels are required, the more renewables you want to build and install. Um, so this appears to mean there is no reliable solution or at least not a cold turkey solution when it comes to getting off fossil fuels. Any thoughts on that? Well, um... Václav Smil is an important thinker about this. I do sometimes think when I, I'm on the train between Vienna and Budapest quite a bit, and you see just a forest of, of uh, turbines, and you think to yourself, well, how do those turbines get made? You know, they're, they're sucking up a lot of power to get made, and I guess the calculation is that if it costs zero for them to go around, you, you kind of make it back. But I agree there, there's some in, in big problems about getting this substitution right. I think the reality also is we don't know what is commercially viable and on the, on the horizon. You know, people talk about hydrogen, they talk about, you know, this and that, um, uh, more tidal. Uh, you know, I, 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 I just don't, the reason I, I'm resisting an argument that says really there's no way out. We're in a kind of we're, we're you know we're trapped. Um, I I don't believe that. Although I don't I can't give you other encouragement than than thinking that <coughs> our species is ruthlessly inventive. We're cunning animals, and when we're in a corner in a bit of a trap we we find our way out it's not very likable but our survival depends on our capacity to generate solutions that i can't even tell you what they are right now but i i, I think we'll get there i i also think that um uh we've come quite a ways with with uh with um, the renewables we've got there is a huge issue about nuclear. Uh, I, I'm, I should be more decisive about nuclear. I go back and forward. There, there are times when people tell me, well, there are these small kind of new 
generation nuclear plants that um, are have sufficiently managed the risk that we can get just a heck of a lot of energy out that that's um, that's clean. Um, and then I've been, I have to tell you, to Fukushima and seen the aftermath of that nuclear accident. And it does give you pause. The 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 the, the, the plume uh, that leaked from Fukushima too is blighted those fields for you know 10,000 years. So if I have to choose, and yes, we have to choose, I'm in favor of um, trying to find a new generation of nuclear plants, small and manageable, that can generate some base load so that the, the variable load can be taken with, with our renewables that depend on climate and wind and all that stuff. But that's those are traditional, those are transitional solutions, and we may be looking at other energy sources, as I say, from hydrogen uh, down the road. And so I don't, I just think we we need to keep faith in our own inventiveness, and um, and I also think we need to talk also about conservation. Um, you know, Europe right now is talking about lowering the thermostats by a couple of degrees, and that makes a big difference apparently. And some of you may be listening to this and thinking, Christ, this is not about lowering the thermostat. The climate is, you know, we're doomed. But I am a pretty passionate believer in the liberalism of small steps, you know, because the small steps add up to big steps if you just keep walking, you know. So um, conservation, new energy sources, and a mix of um, alternatives to fossil fuels, I, I think can get us there. So, one here from a David Grant, and he asks, building on what we have already been talking about in terms of the media and democracy and the important role of conversation and discussion and deliberation in democracy, but at the same time, the challenges with the current social media and misinformation and such and putting those together with government in Canada that is starting to seem to be somewhat interventionist. Um, the recent news about requiring social media to pay for content and that might be somewhat selective and other rules related to social media platforms. Do you have fears about what might be moves towards censorship of some people are arguing around these legislative innovations? I think there's always a danger of, of um, censorship and especially censorship from, you know, high-minded, well-educated, liberal, progressive people or probably as bad at censorship as anybody else, you know, so you got to, you, you, you got to watch yourself is what I'm saying, you know, um, and I think there is some censorship that I support. I mean, I think we all want to, the internet is a sewer uh, and it's a, it's a, it's a vicious sewer and a dangerous one, morally dangerous, and it's harmful to children and it's harmful to adults. And I don't, and um we have some restrictions on that. And I think we need possibly have more because there is some very degrading content uh, that I think does a lot of harm to people. And I, I'm, I'm not gonna lose a tremendous amount of sleep about regulation in that area, though it's not my area of expertise and you need to have a scalpel here. You, know, you, you, you gotta, you, you wanna, you wanna uh, control and possibly ban um, content that is degrading and harmful involves the exploitation or abuse of uh, children, minors, women, men, whatever. Um, that I feel strongly about. You, how you do it is a is a very complicated technical um, question. Um, I I also think that we saw an extraordinary attempt in the twenty twenty. American election with these huge platforms regulating um, the, the fake news problem that is and and <clears throat> I'm um, 
as troubled as everybody else is by the fact that we've handed this gigantic power uh, over to private corporations like um, like Facebook and 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 Twitter. And so you have the extraordinary spectacle. I mean, unprecedented. And we still haven't digested how massive this is of having the president of the United States, um, you know taken out of, of the social media for the for his dissemination of of things that were clearly lies and we're we're walking backwards into a, a world we, we we don't understand and i don't i i, I think um just as we had sherman antitrust at the turn of the 20th century um to control big corporations we will have to have regulation to control these these uh, corporations in terms of managing um, uh, falsehoods that are actually dangerous and managing content which is actively harmful to all of us. Um, we need to regulate that. Uh, I don't, and the reason I'm not worried about censorship or worried about authoritarianism because if this occurs in a democracy, People will say, well, I don't agree with where Ignatiev puts the line. I think he's going way too far. And then, you know, I have to listen to that and we push it back. You know, I, I, if we have robust um, democratic institutions that, that ask these questions and talk about it and discuss it, we will get somewhere that we can all live with. Uh, so the process is terribly important. It's not a question of, are you in favor of you know, censorship of social media or not, the, the real question is how you do it and how you do it democratically so that we have a deliberation about this where we can come to peace um, uh, and, and, and find a solution we can live to necessarily in the short term. Uh, in, in the longer term, we have to make, do something else. It's iterative. The key point about democracy is it's never over. It's iterative. We, we do it one way and then we think, well, that didn't work so well. We do it another way. You, you just keep going. That's what liberal gradualism is all about. And I'm a defender of it because I think that the non-gradualist solutions often end us up in tyranny and really serious non-reversible error. Yeah, certainly your illuminating point, I thought, in your presentation itself about when does the climate emergency end and when do we return to liberal democracy if we suspend it was kind of connects to all of these things as well mm -hmm. and how we react. Yep. Now, I'm looking like we've exhausted the questions from our audience unless something pops up immediately. So I will then take this opportunity to thank you both for your presentation and for engaging us in what was nearly an hour of question and answer. So thank you very much. Yeah. And judging by the questions we had, and as you noted, our, our audience here is pretty deep thinkers themselves and they weren't asking easy questions. Oh. Um, but I think you've left all of us with some things to think about. And again, very much grateful for you making the time for us today. <laughs>